Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, we will be speaking with Shazavar Karamzadi. Shazavar is a Baluch economist, human rights activist, and senior lecturer at the University of Hertfordshire in England. He's the author of several books, including Methodology of Deception, Dialectic of Regressive Errors, and Money and Its Origins. Shazavar, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, it is my pleasure to, to, to be invited and have a chat with your organization and um, to say something about Baluchistan and other issues may come across. So I'm happy to, to be invited. Thank you. The pleasure is ours, really. Uh, first, I was hoping you could tell us uh, a, bit of, a bit of background about who the Baluch people are, a, a bit about the background of the history of both the people and the region of Baluchistan. Yeah, but Baluchistan is um, unfortunately is unknown, but let me just give you some like very brief okay, uh, background about Baluchistan. So there's some data, I've got some data just in case, you know, um, to, to be precise. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, Baluchistan is one of the region in, um, in Plato of Iran. Iran is a Plato, you know, the people that mistake it, mistake it with the country, okay? So what we have at home in this artificial sort of border, and since 1930s, you know, they, they changed the name some part of and from Persia to, to Iran, but Iran it is a Plato. And within in Plato, Iran, you've got different nationalities. And some argue that, okay, the regional people that, okay, they settled in this, in this part of the world, that like Iran, they're Baluch. There is one argument, okay, some people, they say. But there are different Iranian nations that are in the Baluch of Iran. One of these nations is, is Baluch, like Kerd. Right? The Kurdish is another nationality within this um, place of Iran. Fars, okay, is another law, like Mazandrani, Gilak, okay, and the, at guns, okay, all this like the part of this um, the plate of Iran. And um, now the area of Baluchistan is in southern part. When we say like other oh, people that use it, the Persian Gulf or Arabic Gulf or whatever, they, but it's mainly the coastline. Is all the coastline from Bandra Abbas to Karachi is, is Baluchistan. So, um, so it's mainly the southern part of like what we have. Um, Persia and Afghanistan is Baluchistan. And the area is about like uh, uh, 560,000 square kilometers or slightly more or slightly less, but it's, it's something that, okay, with the, the estimate that we have. And the coastal land is, as I said, is from like Bandarabas or slightly closer to Bandarabas to Karachi. So it's, it's quite a large area. It could be maybe 1,000, uh, maybe 200, 300 of up to 500 kilometers. Now, as I said, you know, so Baluch uh, is one of the Iranian nation in Plato of Iran, not what we have as a country. The country is an artificial country that okay, is, is created, which is dominated by, by, by parts of Persia. And since 1666, from 1666, um, Baluch they manage as like different kind of like tribes in that region in southern part to form their, um, their own state. So the first Baluch state as like, okay, we we're talking about for the whole like area of the Baluchistan, it was set up in 1666 until 1839 when the British, they occupied Baluchistan. So British occupied Baluchistan because they moved from, okay, um, remember they went in 1838 to Afghanistan because of the fear of the Russia coming to solve. And always Russia, of course, wanted to have access to hot water or warm water in, in, in South. So because of the fear of, like a British fear of that um, Russia moving to the South, because they occupy Central Asia, so Baluchistan is in Central Asia, and okay, it's mistaken when they say like in South Asia is in Central Asia. So as they moved, uh, the Russian moved to Central Asia, then they, okay, there was the fear that, okay, they come to Afghanistan and af after Afghanistan is Baluchistan. So what they did, they occupied Afghanistan, and it was because of that, the British occupied um, um, 
Ulyuchesan in 1839. So as they move, uh, that is the really interesting part because the two nationality, in particular one nationality, they really, they, they fought against the British because they didn't let the British to have like total, okay, to make Baluchistan a total colony of the British. Um, and it's documented, and the, 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 the struggle of Baluchi is very, very well known. Um, Ashton in a different way, but Baluchi in a very secular way. So that's a really big difference. Baluchi is always, they've been kind of secular. So like religion and other things, for Baluchi is always say, when you see a human being, be treated as human being. Okay, when you see it, that like you never ask them about their religion or whatever they believe, it's nothing to do with you. So they they've got very we've got very good expression in Baluchi. He said, uh, hey, Jesus for his religion, Moses for his religion. Okay, he said, okay, Isapadini Musapadini. It means exactly like that. It's a very very secular way. So they treat people and always they okay, because they because of they treated people as like you know you see as human being. So that's why this uh, the idea that Baluch are refugee accepting and they always accept the refugees is very well known. Anyhow, so when the British they went and this idea of liberalism, okay, independent minded is very, very strong in Baluch culture. So they didn't want, because it's a huge area, a very large area, large land. So this mindset of independence and free, free thinking because of the environment, so it was very strong. They didn't want anyone to come and to have certain rules and regulations and impose them. So they fought very much against the British. And because of that, the British, they decided to divide Baluchistan. It was for that reason. So what they did- they Like a did, divide and rule policy. Absolutely, that's, that's because they knew that religion did, okay, didn't have much function in, in a way. So he, he, he had in India, and that's what they, call, they created this monster Pakistan because of the religious okay, conflict, but it didn't work in Baluchistan anyway. So, and even the first real, by the way, the first religious um, okay, um, mullahs, they were trained by British in Baluchistan. So the first mullah that we have, the religious people that we have, mullah, they were trained by the British people. Mm -hmm. They knew that, okay, there is one way you can control them. Anyhow, mm -hmm. they divided Baluchistan in, the first land they drew, he was in 1871. So the British, uh, you know, we've got the agreements. There, there were so many agreements between the uh, leaders of the Baluchistan. Okay, some of them, okay, they import, okay, they impose on Baluch. But anyway, you have this sort of agreement, and this agreement is as long as British are able to use Baluchistan to take the like military from one part to another part. So not as a controlling the whole Baluchistan. So you've got the state of Baluchistan, the Kalat, you've got the government of Baluchistan, and even they, they were paying them some money as well, okay, to bribe them in a way. So it wasn't totally a colonized, they had certain like, but what they did, then they divided Baluchistan. In 1871, what they did, they drew a line that is called Goldsmith Line. So the Goldsmith land is the land that okay, they drew from north to south and divided Baluchistan into two, two parts, east and west Baluchistan. Like I come okay, from Western Baluchistan. So Western Baluchistan is nowadays under this boundary of what is called Iran. Okay, so well, they changed the name in 1930, okay, in mid 1930s. So it was Persia before it's called, okay. So, and then the Eastern part, it remained under control of the British until you, see, you have eight, okay, 1893, they drew another line, it's called Joran Line. This is the line that they took part of the Pashtun area. So the Pashtun, as again, is one of the Iranian nations in a way. So they drew part of the Pashtun, and they drew, took part of the Pashtun area and gave it to Indian Raj, okay? And the northern part of the Baluchistan, which is, in, if you look at the, the south of Afghanistan, Nimruz and all that area, so is the two part of the Baluchistan, northern part of Baluchistan gave it to Afghanistan. So the two part of Afghanistan gave it to like uh, Indian Raj, and two part of Baluchistan and gave it to, to Afghanistan. 
So that's why then since then we've got three parts. So Baluchistan is basically divided in three parts. Mm. And what happened? Uh, so Baluch, they're really like the one of the nation that consistently were fighting for their freedom. It was one of the nation in that region. Okay, when the, in Iran, they said, look, we fought against the British. It was basically Baluch. Mm -hmm. So they were fighting against the Baluch for their, you know, their, their rights. And, uh, so what they did then by 1920s, it was very clear that okay, British Empire was getting into trouble. Okay, well, German was rising, okay, on one hand as a major power. At the same time, okay, you had United States as becoming the really the main uh, major economy, the largest economy and so forth. So the British Empire and the movement, of course, the movement, Indian movement, Indian independence movement was getting very stronger. So by 19, after the sec, after the First World War, it was very clear that there was possibility to regain independence for the British. So it was Belush that did, and to some extent they were influenced by the movement in India. What was going on in India, they were, but the, they were influenced by that. And also they were uh, influenced by um, the Russian Revolution. So um, the Russian Revolution, I was very quite influential as well. Now remember the first like Congress that they had, what they called them Eastern Nations in Baku. Okay, after the the Russian okay, became the, the you have the Bolshevik Revolution in early 1920s, Baluchistan or Baluch Nation was represented as one of the Asian nation in that okay, that conflict of okay, and all that. So because they influenced from that all this movement and because of the secularism that ingrained in each culture. So what happened then, uh, they, uh, they said, look, it is possible that we can we, we, we regain our independence, okay, through legal means. Mm -hmm. After 1947, when the British, they decided to create, okay, when like, but 1945, 46, British, they decided to, really like, okay, create Pakistan. So they, they're definitely, because that Churchill said, his quotation, he said, keep a bit of India, because they realized that if they are not going to have any base, unless they have got part of the India. And of course, to undermine the okay, Indian independence. So the, in, the, 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 uh, the British establishment, they decided to keep a bit of like India. And then, what? Because they had for, from 1857, they created this parasite force as all the empires they do. Okay, even they do now, okay. even the, what they call Pakistanis or the Iranians, they do in Belichus or they do in Kurdistan, okay? So it's always they create this parasite force. And in India, they created this one from 1857 and it became very, very strong. It became the dominant. So, and it became, because from 1857, when the, the Indian, they started to protest against the British rule in India, they realized that they can use this, the, the, the religious card, religious card okay, to divide and rule very well. And of course, Muslim, they're very important. And Muslim, by the way, in India, they became Muslim, most of them, like after 14th century, after the Turkish and the Mongolian they occupied in, uh, India, and the king of Keshav uh, Togrul said, if you convert to Islam, you don't need to pay tax. So many of them, because economically they, okay, they converted to Islam. So the part that, okay, which became very, very dominant part as a parasite force, it was Punjab, the Muslim part which is nowadays all the Pakistani, as you see. May, may I ask you very quickly to, to elaborate a little bit on what you mean by parasite force? Do you mean like a proxy force to support their interests? Or? It's more than a, a, a proxy force. Mm -hmm. Parasite mm -hmm. force is more than that. Okay. You intentionally, you have a long-term plan to create a force, okay? And you, um, you finance, you organize them 
and you know that they're very, very toxic force. Mm. And you know that very well, okay? So it's not something that even with, if you have any sort of, like a little bit of humanity, okay? Then you know that this gut is going to be a very, very toxic force for a long, long time. And we still got, we can see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So what we see, they patronize. So you've got this mercenary, okay? Really fundamentalist Muslim, okay? You use them as a, against Hinduism, against okay, British, uh, against uh, the okay, Indian okay, um, liberation movement. You finance them, you organize them, you, okay, you make them to do anything they like, okay? So in terms of killing, torture, in terms of anything that, of course, they like, okay? But the free handed okay? So what we see in nowadays in Belichus, we see exactly the same. So it's not like, in Kurdistan, you see the same, even the code, okay? So it was from 1857, they really used, because 1857, what we have, you see, when the British, they went, they didn't go by gun. So in, they went in 1600 to, okay, to trade. So East Indian Company was started, you know, they, this business in South of India in 1600. And after that, this, okay, this company became so powerful that they had their own military. And because of that military, they managed to occupy the whole India. So it was that time that the Muslim Turkish or the, the, the Afghans or the, or whoever they occupied at that time, they were very proud and they used them. So of course, by occupation of that part, um, the whole India, they managed to have, you know, so is, a, uh, is the jewel of the crown of the British Empire. Okay, so that's why they became very, very okay, powerful. So this is, this is at this time that we get in 1857 that, okay, there is a, a, a rebel, okay, rebellious movement by Indian. And in this rebellious movement, so the Muslim, okay, which they came more than for the northern part, and mainly from what is called Punjab, because Punjab, we've well, got East, East Punjab and West Punjab, okay? So East Punjab, they're Sikh, okay? West Punjab, they're, okay, what is nowadays? Anyway, you see the Pakistani, they say they're West Punjab, they're really, okay, that Muslim from West Punjab. So they supported British, okay, group, and, then the British, they realized that they can use that car. So what they did, they employed for their military or administration, mainly from that part of the India. So it was less like from Hindus because before you cast Raj army, Raj army was dominated by okay, Hindus. And Hindus from like what they call it upper class or whatever, okay? But after that, then you see that, the, you know, when you, but first World War, you see that almost half of the, um, the British army in India is from that part, from that small part of, okay, what is Pakistan? Mm -hmm. So they call it like, okay, Punjab. So it was because of that they used this okay, parasite and they prepared that parasite. And when it came to the time, of course, they created Pakistan. So Pakistan has got another meaning, is really, Fascistic is ten. Even the the ten is so horrible, so horrific is unbelievable. The ten means okay. I just give you some background. What it is really? What does it mean? In 1933, one of okay um, Indian Muslim by the name of Rahmat Ali told him. So it's 1933. Remember, it is the rise of the fascism in Europe. And Muslim, by the way. Muslim, the leader of Muslim, they're supporting fascism. The main supporter of the fascism, they're, okay, the leaders of the Muslim, okay? So it's, it's very, very clear. We have to be very, very clear on that. So by 1933, you get this, okay, Indian Muslim from that part of the okay, uh, Punjab world, okay? So he came to Timbri, and he came with the idea of that, okay, we have to make sure that we are going to have to like we create okay we divide India into two parts. So you know in the language in Iranian language or in Indian language okay is India means Hindustan, Hindustan, mm -hmm. means a land of uh, Indian. 
Okay, like Kurdistan, like Balochistan. So, but then he came with the idea of Pakistan. Pakistan, what does it mean? Pak means clean. Mm -hmm. Like languages mean clean. Because everything is deception, by the way. Everything about this monster, what is called Pakistan, this Frankenstein state is called, is everything is lies and deception. So Pakistan means, Pak means, okay, means clean, Stan means land. So according to the Muslim, fundamentally is Muslim, of course, of so other Muslim, not like that, okay, that we got a lot of Muslim, the vast majority of Muslim that are missing. According to the fundamentally is Islamofascist. It means, okay, Hindus are, okay, dirty. Hindus are, okay, well, you can get it from the books. If you look at Pakistani's books, you can get it that me Hindus are filthy. Mm. It's exactly the, it's the language. So Hindus are dirty, okay, Muslim are clean. So we are going to create a, like a country or nation, as they call it now, a country that is going to be clean. So this nation is clean against Hindustan, Pakistan against Hindustan. Mm -hmm. It's highly, highly objectionable, really, okay, the term. No decent human being, no informed human being, no conscious human being, it doesn't matter who they are, anywhere. So regard himself or herself Pakistani. Mm. That is objectionable. That's why it's insult to belief. Mm. When the, she said them is really one of the most horrible thing that, okay, you, okay, as if you're, you, you know, you, you just refer to your torture, okay? So that, that's the meaning. That's to, really to take it back, as you mentioned, the ties to fascism are very evident there with the emphasis that's, on purity, cleanliness. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And mm -hmm. in, in, when you go to, at the moment, okay, to that part, okay, the Northern Control, okay, the world called Cali Pakistan. Yeah, exactly. They use even the term they use, okay, because everything is deception. Even the twist of that one. So when you go to Pakistan, they don't, they don't use clean, they say pure. Muslim mm -hmm. are pure. Pakistan means is the nation of pure. Mm -hmm. And even the army, they call it Pak army. It means army is a pure army, according to yeah. even twisted that one, even the terminology that you had, the very straightforward terminology that okay, you use it, and it's not their terminology, okay? It's the terminology that okay, they borrowed it. Mm. And you know, it's so bizarre. It's, and I wish people, because the, the reason people that don't know, mm -hmm. if people they knew that, they Pakistan wouldn't be in one day, mm. wouldn't exist in one single day. Mm. Okay, of course, it's okay, it was beneficial for the okay, the, the, uh, the empire, British empire, the establishment of British empire, or even nowadays, because a lot of these Punjabis that are here is quite okay, um, um, advantageous for them because to hide it. But that is really the essence of what is Pakistan. Okay, so then what happened? So in 90, when you have what is called three part agreement, okay, which was in Delhi, is signed by, Brit by British and the Baluch, okay, and it's kind of like around the early August, 4th August or something like that, okay, 1947. So Baluchistan became independent, and when Baluchistan became independent, you see, the king of Baluchistan, okay, he announced it, and then what you have, they established two parliaments in Baluchistan, mm. which is limited to the British, okay, kind of like system, political system. You see, you've got upper class and lower class, or upper, okay, parliament or lower parliament, okay. Um, okay, um, they both of parliaments in Baluchistan, they voted to become independent because they discussed all the options and everything, okay, some people they were talking about. Okay, we are like okay, one of the Iranian nations, okay, we close of the Iranian nation. And some talk, okay, discuss about the issue of Afghanistan because, okay, because we are closest to Afghans and so forth. We haven't got anything in common, no language, no history, no culture, nothing basically, okay. So we, but then they decided the second we want to be independent. But because, okay, so it was accepted. 
they announced it. And if you look at on 12 August 1947, the New York Times, it announced that Pakistan became independent. Mm. It is written, okay, it's just nowadays, of course. One good thing that you have nowadays is the internet. You can Google it and you can get it very quickly. But unfortunately, the people are not interested in knowledge. So we know very well. So for that reason, okay, they don't. So, but if you Google it, you can see the, all the documents that, okay, then we understand the Kenyan economy. Now, because after 1947, after that, when they created Pakistan, as I said, just you said, you said, keep a bit of India, because they really wanted to have a base in that region. So it's a long story. We can discuss it for maybe hours and hours, but they knew that we thought that base, we thought that base, they cannot have any power in Asia. Mm. And they said straight away. He said, look, if all India become independent, then we have no base. We have no power in Asia from Japan to less than Middle East. What else? Because Churchill hated India. They say they've got, I don't know, horrible religion and horrible people. And of course, they cannot control themselves. They, they're, they're having a discipline that should be controlled. So he was a racist. I mean, straight away he was racist, okay, especially about Indian, okay? So they wanted to keep that part, and they did. And the other thing, uh, Churchill um, was really, after the Second World War, the end of the Second War, he was petrified. When you are an empire and you lose all your power and you are in debt, okay, for billions and billions, okay, uh, from your ex-colonies, then it's not really nice feeling, okay? And especially when you lose okay, the most important part of your colony, India. So the it's jewel not, in the crown, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. jewel in the crown, yes. Yeah, no, it's not really nice feeling, okay, if you've got that okay, empire mentality. So that's why empires, they become very, very toxic when they collapse. Mm. And the legacy that you have of the empire is really the most horrible thing that you need to get. What we see in Middle East, what we see in India, the creation of this Pakistan state, Pakistan doesn't mean anything, it's a bit of India. So they decided, okay, it was the time that, okay, to have to keep a bit of India. And when they decided to keep a bit of India, it was a question of like few weeks, four weeks. They sent one uh, um, a Welsh lawyer, it's called Cecil uh, Bradley. And they gave him like four weeks to divide India. Hmm. Four weeks. This gentleman never been to India, had no clue what sort of is going on. So he went there, okay, they forced him to divide India. And of course he divided. So the question was, took a bit of like Punjab in North, okay, North of India, so Punjab area, so you've got Punjab area, so you've got the eastern part, the Sikh, the western part. Okay, it's even like, remember, there was large part of like Hindus in western Punjab. Hmm. Okay, large population of Sikh in west, west Punjab. But anyway, so there's Muslim, there's slightly more. So instead they divide Punjab and, okay, Bengal. Bengal was in South. So they, again, you said that you have in West, okay, in Eastern Bengal, you have more like Muslims, like more. And in Western, okay, um, Bengal, their Hindus are slightly more. Other. So they divided these two parts of India. And when they divided this part, these two parts, that's what they created. Okay, East, okay, West Pakistan, in Pakistan, this is what, that's what the Pakistan, okay. So it wasn't anything else. It's nothing to do with Pashto, it's nothing to do with Sindhis, and of course, with, there's nothing to do with, okay, with village. So when they divided, and you had got the, after the Second World War, you had the, okay, the greatest catastrophe in the 20th century. Nearly two million people were killed, nearly, okay, according to their own estimate. So at least 15 to, okay, 15 to 20 million people that they were disappeared, Okay, this place. And even Cecil, okay, Bradley, then he realized that such a horrible thing he's done. So 
So for that, for that sum, okay, responsibility is supposed to get 40,000 rupees. He rejected that because he realized that, okay, this is the most horrible, one of the most horrible things that we've done, okay, in the 20th century, deliberately is something that you don't need to do. It is not something that is necessary. And then when they create this, okay, this really monster, okay, Pakistan, then he said from the day one, is violence, is corruption, is you just okay, fundamentalism, bigotry, you just have to know. Anything that you get is humane, you find it there. So what they did then, that part of the okay, Punjabi Muslim establishment. So it was combination of the military, administration, religious establishment, okay, with what they call the Muslim League, because they created this Muslim, Muslim League. So it was a, that really tiny minority, like 30% of the army of India, which went to, okay, which were from um, West Punjab, and other like the, the servants of the British, which were the loyal, they never, they never wanted to become independent. There was no one single Punjabi establishment who went to prison or asked for freedom, for goodness sake. And you see the, all of the secular Indian, social democrats, okay, liberals, all of them, all Muslim, the vast majority of the Muslim, by the way, okay, so India is the largest, the, large, the second largest population of the Muslim is in India. Mm. So mm. how can this, Time, okay. At that time, it was less than 20, 20 million. Okay, not of course all the population. Of course, in West Punjab, okay, there are a lot of decent people. But that tiny establishment, when I said parasite, mm -hmm. that is a parasite, which was needed. And then they came to power. They gave everything to them. So they had the power. They had the establishment. They had the military. So it's not surprising from the day one up to now is the same establishment is what is called, they call it Pakistan, so it's meaningless. So not just that, they gave them the, the, the Pashtun area, they gave them the Send area, okay, Send, and of course they build uh, occupied villages, which is 45% of what they occupy, and they've got all the resources. And the same mafia, the same mafia, the same parasite, you created a state out of that. So what do you expect from that? What do you expect if you just look at from the day one up to now, how many millions of people they kill? How many millions of people they keep in East Bengal? Mm -hmm. How many millions of the people they displace in Baluchistan, in Sen, in Pashtun area? How many religious fundamentalist groups are they in their hand? Who's I spread all the nuclear stuff in the region? What is really the source of all the okay, horrible, horrible stuff that we get it throughout the world, not just okay, there, is that parasite system. So this parasite system, and what they do, by the way, this Punjabi establishment, the Muslim establishment, what they do, even they cannot trust their own creation, by the way. So from the day one, tell me which okay, prime minister is not being killed, is not being put up in prison, or he hasn't escaped there. Mm. Just give me one, okay? So since then, okay, especially 1956, up to now, who's in charge is exactly this parasite military army, okay? And so they bribe the rest of the world, the Western world. When there was like, okay, Soviet Union, so they pretended they're against the Soviet Union, so they were getting a lot of money from West, mm -hmm. okay? And the West organizing all this Islamic fundamentalist group, including in religious okay? Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. As soon as, okay, that got rid of like, okay, okay, from Afghanistan, it was a good thing, and now okay, Soviet Union, they went to Afghanistan, it was very good. I was a political refugee there at that time. Even the clothes that Germans were sending to Pakistan, they were selling them to Iran. Hmm. 
so I had that clothes. That's supposed to be for the refugees. They were <laughs> bringing at the huge market and sending that stuff to who is responsible for the, the vast majority of drug smuggling in that region? Mm. It's parasite. Mm -hmm. Who is responsible for creation of Pakistan? It's, it's parasite. Who is responsible for the really all the horrible things, okay? Mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda. If you look at at least between 50 to 80 Islamofascist groups, they're organized by them. They're in Pakistan, they are everywhere. Mm -hmm. So this, this parasite, unless people they understand the meaning of this is parasite and this creation of British Empire. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter, it's a Labour Party, okay, Labour Party or Conservative Party, it's all of them there. Okay? So when they after, you know, after 1947, when okay, Mamadi Lijanad, they made the Mamadi Lijanad, okay, they created Pakistan, Mamadi Lijanad became the first okay, kind of like president of Governor General of Pakistan. Before that, this guy was a servitude of village. He was servitude. He was behaving like typical of this okay, servitude, okay, parasite servitude. As soon as he got power, he treated the, uh, the, the leader of the village like ant, hmm. like nothing. And then he realized that that was a big mistake in village that the village had made mistake because they employed this okay, guy, this man, for like more than 10 years, then he knew the, really the importance of the village itself in the region. He knew that weaknesses of the village itself. He knew that, okay, we thought like village itself, there wouldn't be such a thing as Pakistan. It wouldn't exist because 40, 45 percent of the village itself, we've got all the sea. We've got all the natural resources. We've got small population. So he knew all of that, and because of that, then he came okay, with the British okay, um, army. They decided to occupy Bantu. So Baluchistan was occupied in 1947, 1948. Sorry, eight almost eight months after Baluchistan became independent. And since then, we have the most horrific okay, arm in Baluchistan history. So now we are talking about like this in Baluchistan. Of course, we got all, a lot of other problems with other Islamofascists, the rest in Northern in Iranian Islamofascists. But we have the most horrific experience ever in, in the history of religious stuff. That never been, of mm. course. You know, they, other people, they, the Mongolian came to religious stand, the Arab they came to religious stand, the other okay, nationality sometimes, okay, sometimes came to religious stand. But we never, never, ever had. That's sort of like really heretic, okay, experience. 1948, as soon as they occupied the Baluchistan, Baluch, they, uh, uh, they revolted. Hmm. They took arm, okay? okay. For the Western, you still look, okay, if, if they occupy their country, it's good for them to take arm and defend themselves. But <laughs> when you go to, if there is another nationality, no, no. Okay, it becomes something, yes. When they bring the most horrible, horrific, Frankenstein, criminal, okay, that doesn't exist in reality, okay, it has no meaning. Mm -hmm. And they bring that fine, and they support it, okay. But when the, those Belich, they start like, paired like, I don't know, Belich and other, okay, nationality, they start to say, look, we have to, we have exactly the same rights as you guys. So the Belush, they started to, okay, the protest. And of course, they are not going to protest. So since 1947 up to now, is Belushistan is a military zone. Actually, all part of Belushistan, all part of Belushistan. So it's a black hole. Mm -hmm. That means no journalists is allowed, okay? No, okay, there is no, Journalism in Belichistan as well, okay, they killed most of them. So it's a very black hole, and the, okay, the way they portray Belichistan is something totally different. So because they've got power, you've got, remember, we've got the first Islam of fascist regime system was created by British Empire. Mm -hmm. Pakistan is the first 
fundamentalist Islamist, okay, Islamist state. It was created by British. Okay, and it's okay, part of India. Okay, there is no much difference from okay Punjabi one side or to the other side, or Bengali from one side to the other side. They are all okay from okay India, part of India. Uh, since 1948, 1956, these are the military operation in villages of uh, uh, Punjabi, okay? Because Pakistan doesn't mean it is Punjabi Muslim. Punjabi Muslim are in 1948, 1956, 1962, 68, 72 to 70, 73 to 77, we had the largest military operation in that actually Thousands and thousands of people were killed. Mm. And from 2000 up to now, hundreds of hundreds and thousands of people they killed and disappeared. If I just give you like the torture that they imposed, I give you with really like with document. You can go and check them. They just the form of torture, which never been. So in Baluchistan, one thing in Baluchistan history, Baluchistan is they have. That in village culture, there was a capital punishment. Mm. In history, there was a capital punishment. Of course, if the okay, you, you went and killed somebody's brother, they might okay, revenge in that sense, okay. But in terms of the establishment, so something that you have capital punishment, it wasn't it didn't exist. Somehow they sort it out. So there is another part of the village culture. Now, if I if I've done something really horrible to one of your family. And then I realized that I really was, was really horrible thing at the time. If I come to you and I say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm just here, okay, whatever you want to do. Nobody can touch you. So the same family that I, okay, I cause much harm, they protect me. Yeah. So this culture is totally different from the, this, what you have, okay, parasite, criminal, Okay, state that okay, they create it. So I'll just give you some the, the form of torture since they, they okay, what they do. These are just one out of so many. Okay, I'm just giving you that okay, this is okay. now in okay, 90, uh, 1973 to 77, so they liberated religious side. So in that period, Billy Tsang was liberated from the Punjabi army of Pakistan. But because of the even supported like, the, the Punjabi army of Pakistan, then of course they occupied. So when we occupied Billy Tsang, what they did? It is according to one of these officers that, okay, uh, was having a time for capturing the Billy, okay, Billy partisan or civilian, and taking them to the helicopter. His name is Tariq Mahmoud, typical Punjabi name. Tariq Mahmoud, so he is brigadier, and he was he's saying that he said that we are taking this village, taking them to helicopter, and taking them really high altitude, and then we throwing them and taking the video. So that was like one of the leisure of this okay, uh, parasite mindset, Islamo-fascist mindset. So they were doing not just for one, maybe hundreds of them. Crucifixion, but, but, but. one of the victims is Svat. Um, I cannot tell okay, his name because of okay, because we know that okay. uh, he was crucified, he was taken and they put like Jesus Christ. But another one it was a young lad, okay, 17 years old by the name of Nasser Dagar Zahi. He was, by the way, he was captured. So from Panjabi, he was captured with the three other, okay, um, his, his friend. So they were tortured. And we've got, the, by the way, the reports. So he had an interview with one of the village radio. So anyone wants that, okay, exactly what he said. So he was first captured and they were taking, um, and he explained what happened. So they tortured them, they hanged them, 
and one of his friends was crucified. One of the those friends that of him was there. And anyway, after a couple of days, they took them what is called uh, the kill and dump policy they had. So they shot at them and they were saying Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, value child infidels, value child, okay, like, okay, they're supported by Israel, they're supported by, and remember that most of the Jewish they are secular, okay, so it's nothing to give it, okay. Even the Islam is secular in religious side, okay, so he said, look, don't touch anyone, don't, don't harm anyone. So of course he gets people and mentally But he survived. When they shot at him, he survived. He was taken to, um, okay, and look up there, and unfortunately was captured again. And of course, we don't know. But we've got the boys, what he's saying, what they do. So these people with beard, white beard, okay, and Punjabi army, this is the Islam. Islam is just really an excuse for the money. So this is what they do. So that's the battle. In 5th April 2008, Pakistani army arrested Nazar Muhammad Bukti, Rostam Bukti, okay, Gio Bukti, and Jafar Kosa. Oh. And what they did, they poached them alive in boiling cold tar. And that is also reported by Peter Thatcher, okay, the well known, renowned human rights activist in Britain. Three of them, they, of course, they died straight away. After being tortured for quite some time, and one of them survived for just a couple of days and died. Alive, just, this is the, when I say parasite state, this is the, this is the meaning of the parasite state. Then we have acid attack. It was quite something normal with okay, all the Islamic fascists. It doesn't matter if you know in Afghanistan, and especially against women. So it was quite like, we used it, you know, and one thing they fear, okay, Punjabi, okay, Islamofascists, the fear is Muslim, okay, is, is Baluch women, because Baluch women are ahead, very, very, okay, ahead of the, this okay, freedom struggle. What they did in Kala district, on 29th April to, okay, 2010, they attacked on okay, three Baluch sisters. Is, as I said, just one example. Seema, eight years old. Sakina, 14 years old. Fatma, 20 years old. Okay. Of course, they, they detect their faces and all that. So to make sure that okay, Baluch women are going to stay. Ali Jan Sakib or Sargib, as we call it, okay? And he was a very well-known Baluch singer. He was abducted on 12th January, 2011. Then when his body was discovered on 31st January, 2011, when people then looked at his throat because he was a singer, all was disintegrated because of acid. Pouring acid in him. Seventh okay. January 2014, because there were hundreds of hundreds of the village intellectuals, writers, okay, students, okay, lawyers, journalists, they disappeared. Now in Kotak, Osda, they discovered three mass graves in 15 January 2014. Of course, they put like acid and all the chemical material to for them to disintegrate. Okay, but they, they discovered the but who knows what they've done. I just small little small indication that and all of them, all the all the European government, any human like a decent human being. Is responsible for this. Okay. We've got responsibility, we've got moral responsibility, especially British people. Especially British government. Okay, British people are very decent, they don't know. Mm. But British establishment, no, they know it very well. Yeah. And they know very well, but even then they support the, this parasite 
criminal functions on state. Well, I think I think as you as you mentioned before, you know, it's with any shred of humanity, you know, indicating you know the extent of the inhumanity of this. Uh, and and what strikes me is uh, that these Western governments, like United Kingdom, the the former and continuing empires or imperial countries, the the similarity in the tactics that they use across the world to create these kind of parasites or mafia organizations, like you said, to control areas for their own interests, you know, to exploit trade routes, resources, oil, minerals, and the rest. And it's but sickening. The EDOC, you see, it's a long term, a long term, even economically is not in their interest. I mean, it's something I don't understand of the stupidity of human being. <laughs> You see a human being. You see, in long term, look, is that in your interest? Yeah. When you've got free, democratic society, open society, all of our benefit, okay? We live better. We live in human way. We live in a more close way. There is going to be less hostility, okay? More economic development as they, you know, they're so crazy for the economic development. Yeah. I think it is one of the, the features of the capitalist system we live in is this intense focus on short term profit and just accumulating as much as you can in the immediate with no concern for the long term consequences. I wish even they were thinking that way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think really it's a part like, of the, the system. Yeah. Your human being is not really like. Okay, I'm writing a book on uh, economic discordant crisis. I explained very nicely in a way that we blame the system. It's not the system, it's us. Mm. Mm. We create this, you know, as if we create something yeah. that we say, okay, we blame you. Yeah, it's a human made yeah. system, human operated. Religion, yeah. blame religion. Religion is not, if you created, okay, the one monster, of course, then, then you, you can't blame that, it's us. We've got fundamental, fundamental problem. Mm. Okay, I uh, said so the age of enlightenment was a good movement, at least it reduced some of the old idiocy. Mm. But certain aspect of that idiocy is okay, still, uh, they're still there. We need to really to improve it. In a way. Mm. So that's that. So that's why the state, and unfortunately, no. Uh, what we call it democratic societies or democratic uh, government and politicians. Unfortunately, even the journalists, even the politicians, even the academic, okay? So there's so much interested on their own career than really, okay, something as we call it like decent, humane, right, okay? Okay, moral or all this sort of thing. It really changed in the West. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to one of the politicians, okay, to the British politician. And so the first thing is when I say, okay, this is the situation that we have it, and of course you have you have some at least a little bit of responsibility in creation of this monster in the whole region, all the borders that you created. He said, what's the population of the Baluch in, in, in Britain? So I got it straight away. So the Punjab if it's established when they've got one and a half million. So if you've got like few Baluch, who, who, who gives a damn? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because these people that are invited by this okay, Punjab establishment or by Iranian establishment, the stupidity goes to such an extent that you get the prime minister of the, 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 the one of the minister of the Sweden and you go to Iran, he behaves worse than they, mm. those fundamentalists did, you know, put the chado and behave worse than they, okay, Hezbollah did. Mm. That's the stupidity of the West now. Mm. Instead mm. of, if they look at hundreds of hundreds of the, okay, women in Baluchistan, they suffered because of acid attack, because in prison for the equal rights, and you go, and you pretend that you're more Hezbollah than, okay, the, than the support of the Islamic regime. This is what I don't get to, you know? I hear you, I do. I, uh, I would like to return to this topic of uh, the, the Western governments and their role in, in 
creating the situation presently in the region and in Balochistan. But I was wondering if we could go back uh, quickly into the, the history there. As you were, as you were speaking earlier, um, following the formation of Pakistan, immediately the people of, of Balochistan begin protesting, demonstrating, resisting. I'm wondering if you could speak a bit um, from, from that point to the development of the organized liberation struggle in Balochistan. And, and in addition to this, you mentioned during that course, the role that women are playing as leading the, the struggle. I was wondering if you could mention that as well. Yes, it actually is a very, very, very important point to read. You see, um, Balochistan movement, as I said, like the liberation movement, it started from 1920s. Then of course, okay, it was, it wasn't like as organized as okay, we expected. But from the occupation of Balochistan by Punjab establishment of Pakistan, then we see that okay, it's been growing and growing and growing. But this, I think the most important factor that the whole population see that for the whole Balochistan, Eastern Balochistan, Western Balochistan, the Balochistan, which is under the occupation of the Mullahs in Iran or Balochistan in Afghanistan. It's the first time that we see really from, okay, um, if you take it from 1990, it becomes a national movement, a proper national movement. So you've got different political organization, okay, group, resistance group and so forth. And so the relationship becoming closer and closer. And that's why there is a fear in that region because they feel like Kurdistan and Balochistan as two very, very important movements in the region. Very democratic, humane, rational movement. To clarify there, when you say closer and closer, you mean across the Irani Pakistan populations? Yeah. 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 So that the Baluch, like that in the border of Iran, what you've got, Baluch that, okay, that under occupation of Pakistan, and Baluch that, okay, in, 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 in Afghanistan, okay, that is northern part of Baluchistan. So there is getting more closer and closer okay, to uh, even different political organizations. Like the Balochistan movement is one of the organizations that is uh, in one day they can have, okay, they have people in all, all the different parts of the villages. Now, of course, there, you've got local political parties that are located uh, within uh, different parts of uh, the Eastern and Western part of Balochistan, okay, or Balochistan uh, of Pakistan and Balochistan that is under control of the in Balochistan in Afghanistan is slightly because they've been they've got slightly more um slightly they've got slightly more right than other parts of Balochistan. So there you can see that some differences, okay, they can have some meetings or discussions. But in um the the biggest movement, the most organized movement, both in terms of like um, okay. how, how can I put it in terms of uh, partisan movement and in terms of civil rights movement is in Eastern, is in Pakistan, in Pakistan. So we have that, we've got some political organization as well as, okay, if I mention some of the groups that, that at the moment, um, they're quite active in the part of Balochistan. So we've got Baluch student organization. This is one of the organizations that has been active that from, maybe I can say from like really 1960s and 70s onwards, but it is, it's been one of the very important political organizations. It's mainly a student-based organization. And many of the uh, village, um, like leaders, political leaders in the nation. So as I said, we got three religious movement and they, okay, they call for independence. We got uh, British Republican Party. Um, there are many other organizations, but some of them that okay, you can I can say that okay, they are in Eastern Party British Liberation Army in terms of like um, okay, partisan, okay, organized kind of like Liberation Army. So we've got Religious and Liberation Army, Religious and Liberation Front, 
revolution political party quite active and on the other side of Balochistan Al-Qaeda we got um, um, Balochistan People Party and recently there are a couple of other political parties that emerged because after the revolution in Iran probably of the political party they were destroyed because they started when they were put in control. In Afghanistan is most of a civil rights movement like the God organization and so forth and that, um, it's very much like civil rights organization than anything else because they've got relatively flat more freedom than other possibilities. Now, as you said, look with the case of um, uh, women. Women, um, they've been um, very forceful, okay? um, very strong movement in, in village style. Because at least some, I think, there was slightly more scope for women to come and to confess and to be, because otherwise you'd be, you'd be taken in, in, that, in, in the Pakistan after that village side. As soon as you realize that, okay, you've got some empathy to okay, to post political organization or you want for you know, struggling for independence, you let this be. Okay? Is done forever. Okay, so the disappeared. Hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people are disappeared. But women, of course, they're taking some of them. Women's movement is very strong. I mean, just give one example. You see, if I just give it exactly okay, the information that when it, the largest, the longest. Uh, march, in my view, maybe I'm wrong, but the longest march, I think, in human history, it was organized basically by women, mostly by women, for the freedom of political uh, prisoners in uh, the system of the religious and the occupation of Punjab itself. So if I just give you uh, the exact time that these people that um, they did the long, the long march, we started from Chal or Quetta in uh, the eastern, um, the capital city of Eastern Balochistan and the occupation of, of Pakistan. So it started and it was all more than 2,000 kilometers. So they started from Shad, they went to Karachi, from Karachi they went to Islamabad, or in Kansas, to Pakistan. Okay? So it started from October 2013 and it's ended in okay, February 2014. And the vast majority of the, okay, the two, okay, um, the two part in this march, they, they were women and children. Okay, because for the, the young and um, the village, and also for the other people, it was more difficult. And of course, Mama Kadi, I okay, think, is another one. Okay, is, uh, his son was a uh, member of the uh, Village Republican Party, and he was arrested and then disappeared. They, they killed him. So he is, he's an old man, old village, but he is one of the organizers. Okay? He's, he is one of the organizers of Baluch Missing Person. So Baluch Missing Person it was one of the money's organization which they had trying to find out what happened to the love of But so that was one of um, really major, major thing that Baluch did, Baluch women had done. And at the moment, as, as the report of Baluch women, they very, very active in terms of the organization, in terms of uh, um, raising the awareness of activities in the uh, so for for the uh, basically the, the human rights. So that was one. And the other thing that is which is related to um, what we have discussed in relation to what we just said, um, one of the, um, uh, just give you one example of the uh, women involvement. Karima Baloch, um, even by BBC, BBC known on the list of BBC of 100 
most um, influential women in the world. Mm. Uh, it was the name of Karima Baluch. And Karima Baluch was one of really main uh, leader of uh, Baluchistan women movement. Very, very influential. So it, it became very difficult, it became very difficult for her. So escaped and went to Canada. I think by time of, um, I don't know exactly by uh, what day was 2015, 2016 or so. And it's another issue that, okay, when the village, they escape, they come to rest and they've got more problems. So you took her because she was very well known, uh, uh, and human rights activist, very well known in the uh, um, and when she went to Canada, it was very clear that she had so many threats by Punjabi establishment because you know that in Canada, many of the Punjabi okay, the army, when they retired, well, their second home is West, by the way, is either it's in England, or Canada, or Australia, or anything. Okay, so they make a, a lot of money, and of course, they have the life of luxury, luxurious life of outside. So she had so many threats, and she was very well known, and they knew that this was going to be a major threat. Then what happened? She went missing on 20th December, okay, 20, okay uh, uh, 2020, and just like a couple of days on 22nd December, her body was found in a lake. And she wasn't like somebody that you can, okay, um, is going to have leaving villages and with all the struggle that she had from young women to come and do everything. So, and now the interesting thing is that, okay, you put it in, then you make sense. So she was very well known. She could have been one of the ambassadors of the village okay, for the human rights. And none of the feminists, because you can see a lot of stuff about, you know, when it comes to Punjabi establishment, a lot of them become feminists, or Islamofascists, and they become a lot of, you know, feminists very quickly. None of them support them. And she was one of, one of the individuals that truly, in the hardest time, she took the flag of freedom and human rights, even in Canada. And for the Pakistani establishment, Punjabi establishment, it was a big deal. Now, let's relate it to that one. It was the same year, another famous journalist, very journalist in Sweden, by the name of Sajid Hussein, very well-known journalist with high prospect in future outside. That is one thing that Punjabi establishment, Muslim Pakistani, they don't want to know. So what happened? He, he went missing on 2nd March 2020 in Sweden. His body was found okay, in a river or lake on 23rd April 2020. So if you, both of them are very gifted individuals that they could make a difference in West because Sajid Hossein could write and explain what is going on. And his uncle, by the way, was arrested and killed sometime ago. He was one of the very famous Baluch leaders. And Karima Baluch, okay, so if I've written one article as well, you know, you can look at it. I compare it to really like very pioneering individual in human history. They killed him. What the Western countries they did, nothing. What the Western police they did, nothing. They repeated exactly what sort of like, you know, parasite states told them. Now, another example that we, when it comes to the Western, okay. Herbiar Meri is a very well-known Baluch leader. His father was one of the greatest leaders of the Baluchi Sun movement. And for the freedom of the Baluchi Sun, he followed the Baluchi Sun. Herbiar Meri and Faiz Baluch, they were 
Let's call refugee here. They escape from the hundreds of this vulnerable population. Here. By the way, there is nothing in terms of the religious fundamentalism is nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. The British government, the British government arrested him. He was a Labour Party mm -hmm. to have a deal with the most criminal, okay, leader of the Pakistani, okay, Islamist. Parviz Musharraf. So he was military, a dictator, okay, much worse than Pinochet, by the way. Mm. But the, okay, um, Musharraf wanted this leader of the Baluchistan because the head of Mary is one of the most prominent Baluch political leader. They wanted because they, so these are the people that can be quite effective in terms of raising the voice of the Baluch people. So they arrested Herbia Mary and Fez Baluch on what charge? On the charge of the like Islamic fundamentalists. Mm. So they wanted to, okay, they wanted, British wanted Labour Party was in charge. Labour Party, they wanted Rashid Ru, he's a Punjabi, okay, Muslim from Birmingham, okay, who they, okay, was involved with all. That's why they were saying that okay, he wanted to blow up transatlantic airlines in summer 2006. So the British wanted this Russian, okay, Russian rule, and the Pakistani government, the military dictator, wanted the Baluch secular democrat individual. Yeah. So they arrested him. If he wasn't a British court, his opinion. These three individuals, Herbia Mary and Fez Baluch, would be dead mm. today. It's because of this. It doesn't matter that they call it because it was Labour Party, by the way, yeah. in 1940, that okay, allowed for the villages to be occupied by this okay, mm. parasitic state. Mm. So, what they did. And then what happened to uh, Rashid Rose? Of course, he was in their hand. They, 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 Pakistani establishment, Punjabi establishment, human life, it doesn't mean anything. So they use all these okay, fundamentalists, they create the all fundamentalists, they kill them, they send them anywhere. So uh, Rashid Rose was, but they realized that because the British court, they said, okay, these are innocent. Maybe are me and this foolish, they're innocent. They became free. So what happened? Suddenly, okay, Rashid Ru escaped from prison. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is the mindset of like um, okay, in, in the West. And you can see that most of the Belush they come, what they do, okay, when they come as political refugees, we're really not interested, you know, to be here. Mm. Simple as that, okay. In a very dry land, okay, in a mountain somewhere, is more hospitable for us than being here. Okay, it's not something that okay we really desire to be, to be. Even okay, a lot of decent people that. Here. So those villages they come is really they have no choice, and when they come, in most of the Western countries they've got more problems than anyone else, mm. and you get this Punjabi. Okay, they've been involved in all sorts of crimes and they get okay, asylum, they get almost anything. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the, okay. when I say the idiocy of human being. Sure. But also there's a, a strong governmental relationship you know, between the UK government and the Pakistani government. Yeah. Yes, of course, when they, they think but when you, when you think of the decent people like in, in Europe or anywhere else, okay, or the, really the general public, they're very, very decent anywhere you go. So when you talk, they soon they realize that because, okay, is really the general public, they don't know what's going on. So that is one of the really problems that we really have. And the other big issue that, okay, like we Baluch have, you see, they, those people, they occupied us. Okay, we are under their col uh, okay, colonial power and they've got large establishment. It doesn't matter, they're journalists, they're academics, or they're, I don't know, 
what they call the Gargams of Timarvats or anything. You see, you, you can't be a Timarvats activist if you call yourself Pakistan. You can't. Simple as that. Okay? It's absurd to you said that, okay, I'm Pakistan, okay? I believe it, thing, nation, okay? And suddenly your everything your changes in one day because Churchill said that, okay, you can keep a bit of India, so you become totally different things, okay? So it's just absurd. So unless, if you're really decent, and there are some decent, like Tarek Pata, okay, he was, okay, he was from that part of the Pakistani Punjab, you see, look, the whole thing is false. The whole thing is a criminal act, whatever they are. So you can you cannot be. So all day, the, what they call the Punjabi, they call them the Pakistani. So it doesn't matter your okay, academic, your journalist, your anything. They're not really much different from ISA. They're not really much different from ISA. Mm -hmm. Everything they do is to keep you know this uh, Frankenstein state. At the expense of what? At the expense of the human rights of the all the other nations. Sure. And themselves, they are not going to stay in, in by the way, in, where they come from. Okay. They come to rest. And there is a large population from Norway, okay, Canada, Britain, and anywhere you go. And this are one is another force that is really against the village. Yeah. Okay, so undermining the rights. They're in administration, they're in the political parties in the West, they're in the government, everywhere. So if the British, they come, let's say anywhere, they, they give the case to that a Punjabi guy, a Punjabi, okay? Who is really like very closely related to ISO or the Pakistan government? Of course, you are not going to get asylum. That's, that's really that the issue that the okay, is so many sided. But we are, we are not, um, I mean, that is, we know that that is not going to be the same. We are very, uh, hopefully, we are very optimistic. This sort of like artificial state, they are not going to stay. So the Islam movement is very, very strong. It's growing every day. So the whole region really like the movement, democratic, okay, humane, democratic, rational movement is growing in the whole region. So, and that is really is going to be the end of this okay, Frankenstein, okay, parasite state. Mm -hmm. There is, we are quite hopeful. Well, on, on this, I was wondering if you could say a, a little bit more um, about, you, you mentioned that beginning, especially in the 1990s, uh, there began to emerge a broader national movement and a variety of these different organizations, both East, east and West in the Northern part of Baluchistan. I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about uh, from this period up to the, the present situation of the of the liberation movement, as well as the, the armed struggle dimension of it from the Luch Liberation Army and so on. Yeah, uh, you see from um, um, technology has been one of very instrumental, technology has been very instrumental in uh, bringing all the balloons from different parts of the world. And you remember in Baluchistan, okay, you are not allowed basically to use internet or you have enough access, education, really poor, okay? So this idea of the dependency economically, socially, culturally, everything, okay, is part of the uh, colonial, okay, state. But uh, with internet in particular, with the uh, use of internet, with mobiles, um, this technology has been very, very, really instrumental, bringing all different, okay, um, village from different parts of villages start together. So even the village, because the village they didn't know, most of the village they didn't know their history, but you are not allowed to, to know your history, who you are, basically, okay? So in villages, of course, you are not allowed to, okay, to, to study your language. So it was the language imposed by, colonial powers, so even the culture and all those sort of things, even in position of the religion, okay, fundamentalism, all these things, okay, um, were brought from outside. But uh, with technology, the younger generation, they started to realize that, they started to read about the history, about the movement. And by 1990s, in particular by 1990s, um, many of the Baluch intellectuals, 
who they studied, mainly they studied Russia, mm. okay, and the Soviet Union, some of them they returned. And again, they were quite instrumental in terms of reorganizing the British movement. So that, that was quite good as well because they, they knew more about history, they knew about more their rights, they, they were slightly more educated than the rest of it. So they started to organize the Baluch movement. So within the Baluch movement, in particular in Eastern Baluchistan, Eastern occupied, okay, Baluchistan by Pakistan. So they managed to, to make Baluch movement like um, um, to all corner of Baluchistan. So, and after that, at the same time, as so many Baluch after the Iranian revolution, so in 1979 and 19. 1980, so many Baluch in Western Baluchistan. Um, also, they were influenced by the movement in revolution in, in Iran. Mm -hmm. okay. So, because you had different political parties, okay, progressive, and okay, some Marxists, okay, political parties, social democrat, okay, political party, they were influenced. But it was very quickly by 1980-81, okay, the Islamic regime of Iran um, really uh, destroyed the whole movement. So many Baluch, uh, uh, they, they, they left. Okay, they either were arrested or they were killed. Okay, um, but many of them, they left. So also that one, those okay, individuals, they left, they came to Europe, to Sweden, to okay, in England, to uh, other places as well. So another one, okay, was um, very like, important movement in terms of reorganizing the whole Baluchistan movement. Then integration of these two sides in particular, it created a national movement. So there are a lot of debates at the moment between Baluch movement, but you see that the movement is almost the old corner of Baluch Islam. Mm -hmm. So it's the first time I can say in the history of Baluch Islam that we can see that in all corners of the Baluch Islam, okay, uh, we've got a national politics. So we've got national politics in a sense that, okay, people that are talking about like, their rights, people that are talking about different options, different solutions, okay? So it's something that is moving. But at the same time, of course, there is another movement in terms of the resistance, okay? We've got what we call them, you've got Sarmacha. Sarmacha, they're basically the, okay, the partisans. So it's another one, okay, we've got Nassim, okay? In some parts, they're more active, in some other parts, they're less active. But that movement, then what happened? Because of this movement, we had um, almost from different work of life, they joined the Baluch Islam movement. Like many of our leaders, okay, elderly leaders. One thing in Baluch Islam, the elderly people, they've got high respect. Very, very highly respected. But especially if you've been such a decent okay, person, Okay, it doesn't matter if man or woman, if you've been decent person for all your life, there is going to be high respect. And it's kind of like first time that we see in the history of Baluchistan, even that section of the society, okay, is being attacked and killed. Mm. You've got people that, okay, like a um, okay, very prominent, okay, Baluch leader by the name of the actor Bokti. So um, he stood for the rights, okay, for Baluchistan, and he went to the mountain, and then the Pakistan Punjab established the Musharraf, they killed him and all of his okay, colleagues. And there are so many others as well, okay, we've got Didi Mahta, she, she was a lady, and she was the, the one of the bravest women you can imagine. She used to go collect the body of um, Sarmachar, a partisan, in the midst of the fighting, so nobody could go, she could bring it. And even they killed her as well. So that movement, because the people they see that even they really they cannot even tolerate the elderly people, elderly village, and that um, you see galvanized even more village movement. So it's really galvanized in such a way that if you go to Baluchistan, it doesn't matter Eastern, Western Baluchistan, okay, you go, is military zone. Is de facto military okay zone? Any okay, any okay few meters that you go, you've got either the Punjabi established military or the other side you've got Hezbollah or Fasa. 
Okay, so is that's another thing because of the movement of the village sun. Okay, they find it very strong. But apart from that, of course, the location of village sun, location of village sun is very okay, a strategic location for the whole. Okay, east and west and from north and south, and that is another issue really for the, for the people that okay they would want to have a bit of that okay region in, the, in a way, but that one is not going to last. Of course, the situation is, is a very uh, horrific situation, but it's something that is not going to last. So there is a lot of movement. Okay? I, I, I had another interview to another one, one of the colleagues. I was saying that, look, um, you see, we had okay, the age of enlightenment in Europe in the 17th, 18th century, and imagine like, okay, remember Germany, okay, in 1870 was 39 parts. Belichia sign is three parts. Hmm. Okay, for the sun out of four parts, okay, five parts. Okay, so you get that sort of thing, okay, in history. Or Poland was you not know, three parts, okay. So, but in that region, because of the age of enlightenment, what you have, people they realize that, okay, well, individual freedom is very important, okay. Okay, the freedom of belief is very important, okay. Freedom of imagination is very important, okay. And one thing that people they don't see nowadays is the right of the nation. Hmm. You cannot have a law unless you've got respect for the right of the nation. Okay. It was one of the things that it was taken out of that context. Okay. So people that don't see that, it was the right of the nation that they you might you can make democratic right. Hmm. Democratic. But doesn't mean unless you've got representative of that nation, they make decision. Mm -hmm. They made rule of law. The rule of law, you cannot have democracy. Yeah. The Not, rights of the collective. It's, yeah. Yes, exactly. You cannot have un uh, colonial, okay, theocratic geopolitical structures. You cannot have democratic state. You cannot have democratic right. You cannot have a law, democratic law. It's just meaningless, it's absurd. So if the, I don't know, British or anyone, they think that, okay, that geopolitical structure of like Syria, like Iraq, like Iran, like, I don't know, Pakistan, like you're going to have democracy and human rights, they live in cloud cuckoo land. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> can, you, can you give us um, a sense of what these debates uh, are like between these different organizations and parties, as you mentioned, particularly, I'm, I'm curious around uh, their their visions or programs yeah, as, as a party and their understanding of self-determination. Most of them, they're secular democratic parties, most of the village, okay? Of course, mm -hmm. recently, um, recently we have uh, mainly organized by uh, the colonial state, the religious fanatical parties mm -hmm. as well. Because they are open anyway, okay. But the most of the political parties in Belichistan, the secular democratic parties, even some of them, of course, they use their religion to some extent, maybe to like Christian Democrat in a way, but most of them, the secular democratic parties. Now, broadly speaking, then, um, you can see that okay, there is a debate between political parties they call for independence, Okay, total independence and said, look, we just want all these artificial borders. We don't recognize them. They are artificial borders. They are colonial borders, uh, not acceptable. So, Belichia established, okay, as a nation, should be one nation. Then they can be, okay, they can decide with whom they can have a okay, relationship or whatever. So, then you've got that, okay, um, section of the village society or intellectual the debate on that one. Then you've got section of the village as well, of course, they want, um, they use the idea that, okay, we want self-determination, okay? Like they want, in a sense, they say we want self-determination. If you've got a right that is respected within this border, okay, um, democratically, of course, they think the thing is, okay, this colonial geopolitical structure that become democratic, if, you, if all the right is like protected, then okay, we can it's, okay, we can stay with those okay, boundaries, okay. But also within them, when you sit and you talk to them, they say, okay, it's the right of the village people to, to, to decide. 
And there is another group of the village people that they believe in kind of like federalism. Okay, they believe that kind of like we said, look, we want like to have a federal state. And if there is a federal state, um, you've got certain okay, federation, okay, within, within that boundary, again, you can stay. But um, then it, you have the difference between the Baluch in Western Baluchistan, okay, and the okay, Iranian border, and Baluch and the okay, occupation of Punjab in Pakistan. So in Pakistan, is officially like in, it's supposed to be federation, okay? So you have in the name, but is really the ruler of the Punjabi army, which is all the resources and everything is controlled by, by, by them. So, but there are some people that they've got this um, superficial like parliament or the state of villages. Um, so it's all things decided by the Punjabi army and everything is from Punjabi army. But you've got some people, okay, few village people that are part of that okay, process. Okay. And the last one, as I said, there is a um, part of what I say parasite state organization. This parasite state organization, they are uh, religious fanatics. So really there is not a fascist. So these are the group that is basically organized by ISI of okay, Pakistani, okay, uh, Punjabi army. And in Iran, they decided to do the same thing. But because of the difference between the Shia, so the government is, um, the Iranian government is a Shia, the vast majority of the British, they are Sunni. So that conflict emerged. So from the start, what happened, the Iranian regime, they, um, they supported the uh, religious okay, establishment, which wasn't that much because most of the people, even the religious establishment, they didn't like the Islamic regime in a way. But anyhow, they supported. So for a very short time, they supported the mullahs against like Marxist, against the liberal Democrats and all the other groups that okay, they were asking for greater freedom and so forth. But very quickly, the fascist, uh, the Shia fascists, they turned against even those villages. So for a short time, they had. Then the conflict started because they, um, they smashed all the secular democratic movement in Western Baluchistan. So what happened? There was no any other voice. So the people that started through religion, using religion to express their voice or certain rights, religious, okay, some of them for the religious and so forth. So that is another part of the movement that we get people in Baluchistan. And aside from that, as I said, the Baluch women. Baluch women in particular, in particular in Eastern Africa, Baluchistan is been very, very forward. Okay, so it's been movement with all the pressure and the problem that they had, but there is, it's been okay, one of the really like important okay, factor in Baluchistan. Mm. Um, and and could you tell us a little bit more about the the present conditions of of Baluchis, of Baluchi society? You mentioned you've you've discussed a little bit about the the changing dynamics between the populations in these different states, Iran, Pakistan, and so on. Could you talk a bit also about the um, the internal divisions or or conflicts uh, existing in the society now, and, and the general sense of where. Uh, the society is is in terms of values and, and development and so on. Yeah, of course, like any society, okay, when it's uh, in the process of transition, I mean, in particular, when you have an occupation, exactly, so yeah. conflict is going to be very, okay, but that all sorts of conflicts, okay, so there is no really, there is no single day or that we haven't got dead bodies okay, in, in religious stuff. They are they being killed by the, okay, because for the political views or they are either being killed because of the economic situation they have, because you see, you got all these artificial borders that people they want to cross and take goods from one side to the other side, because economically, they have very, really, the situation is very bad. So they've been killed in that process as well. But apart from that, the like uh, occupying state, of course, there are going to be conflict within the society as well. 
very sure. complex in terms of like traditional way of life. Mm -hmm. So um, nowadays you've got new institutions like emerge in finance, just say by our client state, and in particular the religious institutions, I think. So you've got debt, debt squad. There were all mass debt squads and debt, debt squads, okay, some of them of course from the village the community. They use them to really from the uh, section of the society that okay, kind of like maybe this possessed section of society, the section of society that been in everything that they've been undermined or not really educated or hasn't got any sort of not, kind of like unscrupulous of this uh, uh, individual. So they use that one as kind of like this code or for the purposes. So they use that conflict maybe they resist from this individual. So the conflict that um, I suppose that when people they see that they set set them individuals are going to be financed, are going to be organized, and they can use them, they can do anything with absolute impunity, okay? So that conflict is very common. This conflict that it wasn't, it, it didn't exist in Belichistan before. So in, in Kurdistan, we call them Josh. In Belichistan, they call them Lagur. But that religion component is very important. As if that uh, other village they ask for freedom for human rights and all that, they are working for partners for the Israel, Israel or for, I don't know, India, for America, and also for people. So they use that term. So that is one aspect. And other, as also, as I said, in the terms of the tradition, because Belich Islam is leading in a way, so there have been some fascist between very traditional way. Of looking at the world view, and they think that they're changing. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, uh, Baluch society has a or, or maintains a tribal system no, of organization. I think that is something that we get the impression outside mostly. It's not the dominant, okay. okay, but it is exactly one aspect that, in particular, in Eastern Baluchistan, occupied by Pakistan. They okay, Punjabi establishment is protecting it, mm. is okay, is protecting that part, is creating that as if it's such a thing. Yeah, so when they want to talk to the Western okay countries, they say, Look, it's a travel society, and they okay, yeah. they talk to each other. Okay? It's one thing that okay, is yes, it's part of the deception, yeah, it's part of the good, okay, this deception is part of that, okay, it's a good way that okay, you can control as well, okay, mm. so all. Like, okay, in, uh, as I said, uh, the British, they created all this sort of division, Nawabs and all that, okay? Some of this, okay, is influenced villages and as well, okay? And nowadays you can see, you can hear that. So it is one part that, yes, the, in particular, in particular, that's, okay, the Punjabi establishment is financing, it's organizing that. Apart from the villages, okay, the guest squad that they created, they do that one as well. And also that smugglers as well, because of course the region that okay you can use all the food and everything from Afghanistan and all that. So certain individual that if you see that they're quite well off, they are part of the establishment. Mm -hmm. Because we know that okay, most of the smuggling market comes from okay, is Punjabi really military establishment and Iranian military establishment. Mm -hmm. So that a good reason, okay. We've got infidels, Western infidels, okay. So it's one way we can destroy them. That's that's their argument, by the way. Okay, so mm -hmm. that must say, by when you sit with them, then you know that okay, this is what they do exactly. Okay, apart from of okay, they make a lot of money. So that smuggling, okay, the, the opium, or okay, is again there is group of people that they are close to the establishment, okay, and these are the people that of course they will get the complex. They are quickly they quite get well off, and sometimes okay they lose their head, but maybe they challenged the superior, but that's another thing. But the, the, the major problems that we have in villages are the major, major problem that we have in villages are at the moment because of really the press village nation in such a way in, in, terms, in terms of dependency. So 
there is nothing that economically that is viable. So economically, it's basically all day a major source of, of um, sources of um, income that we have or natural resources that we have is under control of our client state. And there are certain parts that you have no real like you cannot go there. So that is one thing that village, because if they hadn't got those natural resources, they cannot trade within the uh, nations. Yeah. So if there is no trade that, okay, there is one nation, okay, maybe as they call it, these are fish bodies, this side and the other one, they cannot trade. And even the sea, which was one of the main source of the income for the people, you know, they, they sold it to China. Pakistan establishment, Punjab establishment, Mina, and there's another source of income is gone. And for some time we had drought as well in, in, in Bilichistan. And the other thing, anything that you do in Bilichistan, every like few meters or kilometers, the military forces, they charge you. So anything that okay you make, they can take you basically from you. So all these things put together, they created um really a very um, horrible situation in Bilikistan. Very, very difficult situation in Bilikistan. So this idea of like dependency, that means you economy in such way that you cannot do like, politically uh, in such way that you cannot do much, okay? And culturally you cannot do much, okay? So in terms of traveling, you cannot do much, okay? So all these things put together, and of course there is no education as such. So if education that we got in, in one side of the religious or the other side of the religious side is useless. Okay, well, it doesn't exist. They might have on the paper that there are so many schools there, but they get the money for the number of the schools where there is no such a junior school. So putting all this thing together, so they created really the, one of the most difficult situations that we found anywhere. Is a very, very difficult situation in, in any sense that you can think of, okay, in, in place of religious stuff. And I'm wondering, as a final uh, point on this issue or this topic of Baluch society, um, you've spoken before about uh, enlightenment and human stupidity as, a, as an issue. I'm wondering what, in your view, uh, what are some of the necessary transformations that would have to take place in Baluch society in addition to the political and economic transformations in order to achieve a progressive democratic Baluchistan? Well, in Baluchistan, you see there is, we can see the some uh, sign of really this uh, process of enlightenment. Hmm. I think in Baluchistan, one thing about in Baluchistan because culturally, Okay, because culture is not going to be created at once, it's going to be created for quite a long time. So there's certain moral values, certain okay, um, social values, certain cultural values, which are really the fabric of the society that we created, you know, for you, okay, long, long time. So when people that like define village, okay, when you like ask a village to define it, all the characteristic of the village that you, you can define village is really like secular democracy, the main way. So um, you, are, you cannot be a village really when you when your people that define you as a village, okay, unless you're truthful, unless you are okay, you, you, you respect the elderly, unless you're going to be okay, you stand for rights, okay, other, okay, for the rights of that, those people that you think they're weaker than you. So unless you're, okay, uh, what else, if somebody comes to you, you can protect it. So there's certain values that, okay, or unless you don't, okay, take belief, as I said, in terms of the black belief, you say, look, uh, Jesus for his religion, Moses for his religion. You say, look, that is my, not really my business to question. I take it as human being. Mm -hmm. uh, all these things are okay, ingrained, and this liberal mindedness, this sense of the liberal mindedness, even if you are religious, like if you can use it, okay, apart from like with some few religious people, they were trained like in Pakistan or before in India, so they become very rigid. 
but the rest that means part of your cultured life, music, poetry, all this, okay, the part of your, this, uh, you grab minded. So these are part of what they call their life, okay, they describe and being a value just characteristic of the way. So they exist, okay, even they undermine some of aspect of this because of colonialism, right? It's very strong. Now, apart from that, you see the movement that we have from military side, okay? Um, actually, both sides of the movement that we have, both sides of military side, all three sides of military side, you can see that this, the, all, you see all these trends in, in military side. But you said the leader of the, the really the prominent leader of the village of liberation movement, all of them, they've been secular. Secular democratic of the leader. And new generation as well, we can see that when there is a debate, with all sorts of debate, all the political parties that okay, you see, is really in a very rational, okay, democratic way debate. Of course, you have some okay, clashes of okay, sectarianism in parts. Okay? It's, it's part of the political activities. But when you see, when you, when you debate with them, then you see that this secular movement and also believe what they've done, they published, okay, um, not long ago, I think something maybe a million, uh, maybe about 10 years, is they all also published the liberation, okay, charter movement, liberation charter for religious studies. So many, many political organizations accepted some of them, but okay, you've got the document that, okay, clearly defined what sort of like movement, what, what sort of okay, system you're going to have in village and stuff. Generally speaking, all of them put it together is the main trend, the dominant trend is rational, democratic and humane system with any okay, uh, variation that they're going to say. Even all those they said that, okay, we want like, I don't know, let's say kind of like federalism, but their mind, their idea is that one. Of course, they within that thing, within that okay, colonial geopolitical structure, you cannot have. But all of them they have that taking perspective that religious can uh, can develop, it become peaceful when you've got a free democratic okay government, a free democratic society, a free democratic okay society that with rule of law, that okay all the ideas okay. Is the freedom of belief, rule of law, okay, um, freedom of political parties, okay, all these things, okay, this this is part, and that's why. So they they one reason that you don't hear the voice of village people, so because it is a quite humane, democratic, rational movement, so it hasn't got okay. You cannot market that, but it was it's not a fascist movement. You quickly, all the BBC and okay, most of America and everyone, okay, they talk about this. That's that's one big one. Mm. And another another topic which we've uh, touched on a little bit, but I wanted to ask you more specifically about is the geopolitical dimensions to the present situation. Um, Balochistan is a is situated in a geopolitical hotspot area in Central Asia, as you mentioned, with. Iran and Pakistan both being uh, big topics for Western governments, as well as the proximity to the Middle East, India, China. And it has uh, mineral resources, it's quite rich in mineral resources, this area. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, um, as you have be already, uh, a bit more about the international geopolitical dimensions and interests uh, that are shaping the present situation in, in Balochistan and the role played by, in particular, Western governments. Yes. Um... Uh, remember, of, of course, uh, I think it's a, a recent thing that people that started there is such a thing as Belichistan, what they need that they believe, such thing as Belichistan, but since it was, they had influence in the occupying state like Pakistan and Iran, and, okay, um, so at that time, they thought, okay, this geopolitical, colonial ge geopolitical structure is going to remain forever. But nowadays, after all these changes, they realize that now, Really, Belichistan is much more important okay, in that region than those states as such. They, they know that very well. Mm. I think the American, they know that, the European, they know that, the Chinese know, they know that, the Russian, they know that, and all that. Okay? 
But so in terms of um, uh, geopolitical location, location is very, very important globally. For what you have okay, in East, you've got all India, China, all the refineries. Okay. In South, you've got all the sea and you've got all the, the Arabs. Then you go very close to okay, Africa. In North, of course, you've got uh, Afghanistan, Central Asia and all that. And okay, in East, you've got the rest of, you know, you go to Europe or you go to okay, other parts of the Middle East and so forth, okay? You go to Iraq, you go to Turkey and so forth. So in terms of location, since any, you can, you can use the sea, all these major ports, you can have major ports. So that's why they started to, they realized that, Iran realized that, Pakistanis realized that, okay, they can use these ports for their own okay, power as such. But at the same time, no, you get this clash of um, the Chinese, India, from East, and of course you got from West, they realize that there is, that there is one, that, that part of the, that region is going to be very, very important. So we can see that clashes that at the moment is going to, okay? It's very obvious. Mm. There is going to be a clash and there are debates there is definitely there are debates between Western countries and Chinese, okay, from East or Indians and so forth. And the main spot is Balochistan. So we see that at the moment, Chinese, they've got a large chunk of the Balochistan because the Pakistan is so basically. And there are areas that, the mineral areas that is basically Chinese, they come by with, uh, with airplane, and it's controlled from both sides. So the British are not allowed to go there. We don't know what is really happening there. So they come by airplane, they extract the minerals and they take it from there. And so they, you know, the contract they have, well, nobody knows what sort of contract, but apparently what we see on the media or somewhere else, it's not like maybe, okay, like 60, 70% it goes to Chinese, whatever they, they extract. So it's like 20%, something like that, okay, maybe goes to, to the Pakistani army or the Punjabi army, nothing to Balochistan. It's basically nothing to Balochistan. I mean, you just have it, even 1% you don't get it. So there are part. And even there is a port that, okay, it's called Guada in Eastern Balochistan and the occupation of the Pakistani. So Chinese, they spend a lot of money there. Something like forty billion dollar for that process, okay. And again, uh, they thought that the Punjabi establishments they thought that okay, this is only where they can survive, but they don't know that okay. These things they they've got unintended consequences. Uh, um, so the, the Chinese they are not that stupid. They very quickly they realize that how really this Frankenstein state, how corrupt and criminal they are. Sooner or later they realize. So in that sense. At the same time, the Iranian regime, okay, the Mullahs in Iran, also they realize that okay, they need that part of the region. Okay, so again, it is military zone. So they brought Chinese. Okay, they sold the the, 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 the sea. Basically, they rented the sea uh, to Chinese, and also they brought uh, the Indian in Chabahar. Okay, to do some economic activities, activities they are doing also the Russian. Mm. So they brought Russian as well. So it's a mixture of all these okay, activities is going on. Then with these activities is always when you get this cocktail of really the most horrible, okay, most ghastly sort of the states, okay, and criminal states, totalitarian states, and with Islamofascism from other side. So these are the things that is going to be, uh, have unintended consequences. Unintended consequences is something that, as I say, is there is going to be explosion sooner or later. An explosion in that region, that means you're going to change the whole structure of the region. Mm -hmm. So when I say like the rise, or you get kind of like the change of like age of enlightenment, is the age of enlightenment when you get the most really horrific situation 
Okay. There is a poem in, in, in Parsi, when you say you get, get things get worse and worse, but there is one point, you can't go beyond that. Mm -hmm. So that is a situation because the whole region, if you look at the whole region as a, one of the main region in the world, is one region that you really we didn't have the age of enlightenment. Hmm. So there's been movement, we've been movement in Europe, in North America, in South America, later on to some extent, okay? To some extent, we have, you know, in Paris, some changes, on it. but one of the very important region of the like, world, okay, that's, okay, a lot of apparently civilization, history, and, okay, has been there, and the main religion of the, okay, West, basically, they come from them, the movement. So you've got this artificial state, okay, because all the this division came after 1915, 1916, when the British and the French and the Russian, they wanted to divide, okay, the region and created up all the artificial borders. So all this um, extreme violence that we have, extreme fundamentalism that we have, it, at the same time, the movement that we have, questioning that the whole thing is part of these changes. You tell me just one state which doesn't hate the other state. Mm -hmm. Just give me one. None. Okay. Turkey hates Iran. Iran hates okay, Turkey. Uh, I don't know. Um, Iraq hates uh, Syria. Syria hates uh, Saudi Arabia. I don't know. Is one. Um, Afghanistan hate Pakistan, Pakistan hate, he said, just give me one. Mm -hmm. but when you get that sort of, and with all the other from outside, there is no any other way. There is no any other way for uh, uh, social movement, unless the social movement is going to be rational, democratic, humane, legal. Mm -hmm. They haven't got any other. So tomorrow, if somebody comes like Gorbachev, for example, if you, come, if is, you, you could be like Gorbachev or you could be like Saddam Hussein. Mm. Okay, you have two cho choices, okay? Mm -hmm. Any other choice, do you mm. so If they come other way, so what they're going to do? Is it going to be possible for the, I don't know, Iran and other, okay, to still occupy Kurdistan? No. To occupy Azerbaijan? No. To occupy Belarusistan? No. So these are the things that, okay, is, um, um, I think is in the process of change. And the, the, the important thing, I think, is all responsibility, okay, of those really responsible, humane, Democrat, okay, people anywhere, decent people anywhere, you make sure that you have, you have been to have transition, this transition is going to be based on those things. It's going to remain democratic, rational, and legal. Hmm. And following on from this, uh, as a final topic, I would like to, to ask you about, um, you, as you mentioned, the, um, the region of, of Baluchistan in general really is a, is a military or militarized zone now. And um, the Baluchistan Liberation Army, uh, which is an armed organization, what you described as a partisan organization, is, is one of those organizations that have been criminalized under the global war on terror as a terrorist organization by the UK government and a lot of other Western governments. And, and um, recently, the, the UK-based Campaign Against Criminalizing Communities, or CAMPAC, um, uh, whose membership includes Baluchi organizations, um, has published a report on the developments over the past 20 years of the global war on terror and uh, discusses the impact on uh, Baluchi community in the UK diaspora as well as internationally. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how this criminalization under the anti-terror regime, the global war on terror, has affected the Baluch liberation movement, both in the region and in the diaspora. Yeah, because uh, as I said, the, what we have, um, it was because of that they used this um, this phrase, okay, the campaign against uh, terror. They don't know that, okay, all these states, the source of terrorism is, is, is there. You know, like, Okay, Pakistan is the big, um, mm -hmm. is the main area. Of the, of the Punjabi area. This mafia parasite is the biggest terrorist. <laughs> uh, you know, but it was exactly because of that they arrested Helia, 
and pays Baluch in 2000, okay, 2007, it was because of that. They used that idea that, okay, they use, okay, we've got, okay, that we are, we are uh, struggling against the terrorism, Islamic terrorism. And then you, you go and arrest the most secular, democratic individual you can imagine. Yeah. So, yes, Belush, they're really effective. And all the political parties also know we've got the head of our, another political party, okay, Belush, Belush is some Republican party. Uh, and he went to Switzerland. He's, for many years, he hasn't been granted political asylum. Mm. Okay, so there are many Baluch that they come. Okay, there are many Baluch they come, they escape. Um, it's very difficult for them to get a political asylum. Okay, and few of them, okay, few of them they were deported, and we don't know really what happened to them. I mean, I can find the documents for that, okay, when they were okay, deported. Okay. But we don't know what happened because, like, you see, another big problem in Baluchistan is the question of his, his disappearances. So the people that we put in, and we don't know really what happened to them. Um, few of, you know, some of them, what they call it, the Pakistanis of Punjabi, they have this okay, the, uh, policy, the kill and dump policy. So what we had, um, after like a few months or sometimes so quite a few years, then we could find the dead bodies, okay, mutilated dead bodies in different parts of the side. But with hundreds of hundreds of people, they disappear. So that is another thing that um, that is really one of the major, major issues of village is the uh, individual. What happened in, um, in Chile, in Pinochet Stam? So, According to that, okay, all well, the main sources, it was something like 3,500 people did speak. So, to official like statistics. Um, other sources, they say up to 12,000. But in Baluch, since 2002, according to the uh, um, Baluch, um, different Baluch organizations that okay, they, they got people all around Baluch, Baluch missing person, is that. Families organization, they're talking more than 20, 25,000 people this year. Hmm. Even in, it was in 2005, even the Pakistani uh, um, minister, Pakistani uh, minister, they said like 5,000. At that time, 2004, 5, 6, it was that time that they said it's 5,000. They say we. We arrested them, okay? They're in all hands, even at that time. So after that, okay, remember that, okay, a lot of changes from 2006, it was, the movement was, okay, um, is getting um, more, like, okay, stronger and stronger. So the number of people that disappeared is really a lot. And in the same way, in Western of our village style, I'm just really one, um, this is one I've done cal calculation based on uh, Amnesty International okay, report. From 2004 to 2009, in uh, Iran executed almost 1,500, according to the official statistics, okay? And it's taken by okay, Amnesty International. So that was the, uh, okay, the population of something like 75 million. And if we take, if we estimate the British population between maybe three million, three and a half million, or four million, then out of that, of 1,500, 800, more than 800 of them, they were British. So compared to that population, in terms of the, if we take the ratio okay, from that okay, population, so the number of people being executed in the world was the largest in the British side. By the Islamic Kingdom of Iran. It was just for that one. Whoever wants the document and the platform, you know, even in the book, okay, the, this methodology of deception, so I put it here exactly all of the, all the documents that exist in this document. So we think that the number of people being executed, the number of people who are being disappeared or imprisoned or being killed, is just unbelievable. 
since you haven't got any journalists to report that, local journalists, okay, they help almost that don't exist. If there is any decent journalist want to say something about them, they've been killed. Uh, this is really one of the most horrific harm in village history. I think there's, of course, very much more that could be said on all of these subjects, but I think unfortunately we've run out of time. Uh, Shazavar, thank you so much for joining us and speaking with us. Are there any final thoughts you would like to leave us with in closing? Uh, thank you very much, okay, for really inviting us. Okay, um, my final really thought is because it's not just the situation in the religious side. We've got the same situation in many other okay, nations, okay, uh, stateless nations. Um, other communities as well, okay, um, women's rights, workers rights, okay, children's rights, and almost anywhere. So it's really it's a very democratic, humane, okay, and, um, it's our responsibility really to, to defend the rights of all, all the human beings, wherever they are, uh, to have equal rights, equal rights and to live in peace and in a democratic and safe way, basically. Absolutely, my thoughts are the same exactly. Thank you very much again. Thank you, it's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you so much.